very much. So welcome. We like to always say plastics are fantastic. I work in the plastics engineering department at UMass Lowell, and so we like plastics. But what are they? So when you think about most molecules that we're familiar with, such as water, which is, makes up part of us, a drop of water contains, well, a lot of molecules. I won't say how many that is. And they have a very unique structure, and they're small. By contrast, we have polymers, which are considered macromolecules or big molecules. How do we make big molecules? Well, we start with small molecules, such as a monomer, ethylene, which is a gas. And if we put them together, like a string of beads, we end up with a polymer. So we take our ethylene gas, and we put it together, and we make a polymer. We make something that's solid. But maybe to demonstrate for us to think about how a polymer behaves as composed to a monomer, I'm hoping I can have someone come up here and do a little trial with some, I'm going to make it challenging, with some chopsticks. So I have food, I have rice, which I think of as a monomer, and I have some pasta, which is longer, and I think of as a polymer. So if somebody wants to come up and just take one out, what do you think about it? Come on up. You want to try the chopsticks or the fork? All right. She's brave. So see if you can get one, one piece of rice out of there. I know that's really hard. Yay! That was really good. So she got one. It was very easy. It came right out. Now let's see if you can do it with a piece of spaghetti. Not too bad, but they're a little more tangled up. Thank you so much. That was really good. She's got future. That was a very impressive, getting one of those pieces of rice out there. I know you couldn't see it, but she got one grain of rice. So one of the things about polymers is that they do tangle up. And when they're tangled up, it gives them a little bit more strength properties. So because they're long, they have better properties as compared to our rice. So we always like to think about food in terms of polymer materials. So polymers being very nice materials to work with, we can make a lot of different products from them. And so here, for example, I'm going to pass this around. This is a bag of polyethylene, and these pellets are what you start with. So you start with a small piece of polyethylene and fabricate it into different structures. And within this are many, many molecules, but they're still large, so I'll pass this around. So we start with that, and we can form it into different shapes. And you probably all use some of those products today. Perhaps you use something for uh, babies, you might use your glasses, for example, and your car. Your car has a lot more plastics than you think about normally. Part of the reason is it's light in weight, so it can move more easily and uses less gas. So it's better for the environment. But you also have polymers that are shaped into a tire, for example. This is just a little piece of a tire, but a tire has polymers within it, and it has some very unique properties. It keeps the gas inside. It has a barrier. You don't have to fill up your tires every day. And it has good traction and friction. So there are lots of ways to use polymer and plastic materials. How about your shoes? So here, for example, is a shoe bottom that's made out of polymers. So if you walked here or you drove here, you came here using some polymer materials. So again, there's lots of opportunities. They're light in weight. They're very flexible. They can be rigid, they can be soft, and they can be recycled. So if you heat them, they can be recycled and reformed. How do we actually make those pellets that I passed around into a three-dimensional shape? So there are lots of different types of pieces of equipment that allow us to do that. So how many of you used a trash bag today? Or maybe yesterday? Did you ever wonder how they were made? Maybe. So what do you do? You take your pellets and you heat them and then you push them through a pipe. And as it comes out, you put air in it and you blow it into a film. So this is a blown film line 
And in here, you heat your pellets. They come up in a tube. And then while it's still warm, it's fluid, it moves, and you can expand it. And you can make a bag out of it. So we made a trash bag out of our polymer. Or we can make a three-dimensional shape. We have in here a piece of equipment, almost like a drill, inside a tube that heats and forms this and melts this polymer pellets and pushes them into a three-dimensional mold that has whatever shape you want. So for example, your shoe sole, perhaps your glasses, your razors that you use, all of those are made by what's called an injection molding process. So again, same material, we can shape it into different things. This can make a part in 30 seconds or less. So very fast, very efficient, wonderful way to make materials. Or we can extrude them. So that makes pipes and films, but just as a sheet form instead of a bag form. So here, for example, I'll pass this around is a film. I take my pellets, I put them in this tube where I have my drill shape, I twist it, I heat it, and it comes out and it forms into a nice film. So I can make a film. Why would I want to make a film? Well maybe I want to make something for packaging or maybe I want to make something to put over in my garden. So again, lots of ways they can be formed very fast, very quick, and I could take that film and re-grind it up and reprocess it so I can recycle things. Well, we're talking about nano. What's important with nano? Can we improve plastics by incorporating nano? What is nano? So if we think about nano, something really, really small. When you think about a human being, they're, say, six foot tall. That would be 1.62 billion nanometers. That's a lot of nanometers. But if you start thinking about biological things such as DNA from which a human being gets all of its information, DNA is 1 to 12 nanometers. You can't see it with your eye. It's very, very small. But it's the building block from which we all come. So nano is very important. What can we do with nano and polymers? So you can see the polymer, it has macro properties, but what if you put something nano in it? Can we improve anything with plastics using nanotechnology? So one of the things that you can do is, if I want to make um, packaging for my food, for example, I might want it to last longer. And the military has meals ready to eat, and they want them to stay dry, and they want them to stay in good um, resistance to oxygen for a long period of time, so long storage. How can they make it better? Well, you can use the plastic film, but it isn't as good as if you actually add in some very thin nanoplatelets. So these act as little barriers to oxygen coming in. But how do we make this? So you could think about it, but how would you actually make it? Well, it turns out we mix it just like you make a cake, and then we extrude these films, like being passed around here, and inside those films would have these little platelets. We can also take those films and put lots of films together and make a multi-layer film, like you see here on the right, with all different types of materials and different layers in there. So we can make a nice, better packaging material to help preserve our food longer, and maybe to make the military have rations that last for a much longer period of time. What else could we do? How many of you have ever put rubber gloves on and gone outside when it's hot? What happens? You sweat. It's not very comfortable, right? And if you put rain gear on, you keep water out, it, it's very uncomfortable. You get hot. Well, can we do anything to change that? Maybe this is a little different. This is more selective barrier. We want it to resist water coming in, but let moisture in the form of vapor escape. So we were working actually with my favorite material, rubber, and doing some unique things, once called electrospinning, where you charge it with an electric current and you go to a target and you make this mat of nanofibers, which you see on the right. Well, they're porous. And so we took rubber, 
which is very non-porous, as a sheet. Here, you don't want anything to get through it. You want to keep the oxygen in, but we made it porous. This is taking the rubber that's the same as the inside of the tire and doing the electrospinning and making a little film. And you can all um, come in and touch it. I'll pass one of them around. It will resist the penetration of water droplets, so they won't go through. But if the experiment had worked right, you would see that the vapor will actually permeate out. So you can make something that's good for rain wear, but allows the moisture to come out and be very comfortable. So we were thinking about using this, for example, for the soldier to give them something that's stretchable, but also lets moisture vapor escape. So this is a very small piece, but I'll pass that around. Thanks, Marisol. So that's an ex another example of using materials and nanotechnology to make a unique material that you couldn't make just by having the conventional rubber. But how about solving other problems that you have? One of the problems that we have is buildup of ice. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that from this year. Lots of ice, lots of snow. That can cause problems with heavy weight on planes. It can cause cable and electrical wires to fall. We want to do things to get rid of ice. So what can we do? Well, it turns out that Mother Nature actually has already developed that for us. And I'll show you in the camera the example here of a nasturtium leaf. And I'll come over here so we can all see what's going on. And if I take a drop of water onto this leaf, you'll see that it just rolls right off. So it just pops right off. So the water doesn't collect on the top of that leaf. Mother Nature does that already. So can we try to think about being like Mother Nature? Well, first of all, it might be nice to figure out what actually Mother Nature did in order to get that to happen. Well, it turns out the leaf has two sizes. It has microscale bumps on it, and on top of those microscale bumps, it has nanoscale bumps. So it has two levels of size on it. And those two sizes change how the water sits on its surface. So what it, could we do to try and be similar? Well, first of all, we took a look at the structure. And it turns out, if you just have a flat surface, the water will sit on it and probably stay. If you have two sizes, the water sits up, and it's very easy to roll off. So what we wanted to do was try and create a surface that looked very much like Mother Nature, but do it ourselves so we could put it everywhere and perhaps would work uh, in some other applications like colder temperatures where the leaf wouldn't survive. So we actually did develop that, and that's a picture from a microscope that shows the surface that I'm going to show you next. So we developed a structure using some nanoparticles and some polymers together to make a coating that will give us some very nice super hydrophobic behavior. So this is an example here of that surface. And you can see we've coated it on a piece of glass and put it on the surface. It also will roll right off just like the lotus leaf. So we can create structures that look just like Mother Nature, but we've designed them ourselves. And hopefully we can put them on other surfaces, such as um, a plane wing. So I'm going to show you an example of some work that we did where we took it outside in the cold this winter to make sure that it would work the same way. So here's an example. Minus 2C, pretty cold out there. The students put that surface outside on the cold day and then put the water droplets on. And you can see that the water will just run right away. So now we have created a surface that's much like Mother Nature, but then allows the water droplets just to be carried away very easily. So therefore, the ice won't build up on these surfaces. 
So that's a little bit about what we do with nanotechnology and how nano can be included in plastics to help hopefully our everyday lives. So one of the things I want to do is just thank all of the students and faculty, many of whom are here today and you will see down at the other exhibits who've really helped all of this happen. We can't do it without our students. So I want to thank them very much and also thank the Museum of Science for getting me up here. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Dr. Mead. Wasn't that great?